begin. Welcome everybody to Kelly House and welcome to Sunday Afternoon With. This is our fifth presentation for this season. We start out in April and every fourth Sunday of the month through October give a presentation that relates to uh, local history. And so far we've had the Compshi Fire Department, we've had the early innkeepers, we've had musicians, and uh, we had uh, one last month on the architecture of Mendocino. And uh, today we have one about people. So uh, the object here is to not only uh, keep history alive and make us all remember things from the past, but also have it preserved in the museum for those who come along in the for future and wonder, well, what is going to happen? What was it like in those days? So it's, it's, it's a good way to have us all reminisce and at the same time have it for those uh, who come along later wondering. So about uh, Kelly House, we hope that you will consider becoming uh, a member. We are very active. Uh, with the membership, you receive a copy of the Historical Society's publication every year, and you also get a discount for our Sunday afternoon program events and we have a wonderful auction that's coming up in September this year as our main fundraiser for the year and also if you're interested in becoming a docent it's uh, a, a, a fun time to be in the house to welcome visitors show them around tell them stories about the past and uh, really promote the museum as part of an important part of our town here in Mendocino the program today is taped. We want to thank Terry Vaughn from Mendocino TV. And uh, it will be available afterwards for sale through the office. And if you know anybody who missed one of the earlier programs, but who'd like a DVD of it, we do have those available as well. And um, if you have any questions about that, uh, you know, they, they have the order forms and we'll help you out with that in the office. Or we can take the order forms today if you prefer. So I am very pleased to <coughs> announce and excited to welcome Lisa Gruel Spicer, who is a professor of anthropology at Western Washington University in Bellevue, Washington. Bellingham. Excuse me? Bellingham. Being not a Washingtonian, I apologize. That's okay. So, uh, uh, the story goes that Lisa came to Kampshi in 1970 with her mother and two sisters in a purple school bus. <laughs> and uh, she was part of the growing group there of new arrivals who uh, at the time, even today, we still call hippies. Mm -hmm. And um, she attended the, the uh, elementary school here in Mendocino and also the high school here in Mendocino. Then, along in 2008, she decided to come back to her 30th reunion at the high school. And much to her surprise, she found that Kampshi was very much the same as it had been 30 years earlier when she was growing up there. And this absolutely fascinated her. And uh, at the same time, she had just started her master's program in anthropology, and she decided she wanted to find out what, what were the ingredients that were making this community so special of the old timers and the new people having come together, supporting a community, working together, and that was the question that she brought up to write her thesis. Hmm. So the title of today's presentation is Common Ground, and it turns out that is the element that really has helped make everything work so well. So I think we should give a warm welcome to Lisa Spicer. Um, uh, that 
it's fresh and new and we're presenting it back to the community from which it was done. And that's one thing that we do in anthropology is we take our research back and our findings back to the community where we studied it. Now it's happening more and more among ourselves because all the undiscovered people have been discovered in all those exotic <laughs> places. So now we're using anthropology to look at ourselves. And that was um, one of the wonderful things that this project is helping with and anthropology is helping with is to actually understand the 70s. Um, as probably a lot of us young people that were kids back then, you go off into the world and make friends and you think that, uh, well, we're culture bound. You think that our normal reality is everyone else's reality and it was very different. And I realized that we had a very unique type of childhood and a uh, unique town. Maybe not totally unique in Mendocino County, but certainly in relation to the rest of the big wide world. So what I'm going to do is uh, skim through a little bit of history. Some of you may not be really well versed in the Mendocino, the North Coast history. Um, but it gives context, and to me that's really important because even for the whole hippie movement, well, why did that happen? What was the culture that created the counterculture? So I'm kind of always thinking, well, why, why did why did we do that? What was the situation that created this? So we're going to do a real quick um, tour through, see if I can do this technology. <laughs> okay, the North Coast, and especially remember this is presented to um, my faculty in uh, uh, my search re uh, research committee in Washington State, so there's a little bit more to that I know you all, most of you are familiar with. But of course, this is the North Coast from the Dega Bay up to um, the Oregon border. So that's the general area that we're looking okay. at. And this, in, in specific, is Comchi. This is the Comchi Prior Road. And I do believe that this is the store. I think, whoops, now this is going on automatic slideshow, and I couldn't make it stop. So um, I'm going to have to call you back in I've been telling it off, and it keeps repeating. So <laughs> anyway, uh, maybe if I hit stop, it goes away. It will make me talk fast. Um, anyway, this is the Comptu Prior Road. Um, there are out of this is a little bit frustrating that it keeps moving on, but there are autobiographical elements. Um, I was in the class of '78. I didn't actually graduate from here. I was in France for my senior year of high school, um, doing a home stay program. But there was conflict in. Stop. Oh, Dang it. It's going down. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. There was conflict um, in the in the 70s in Comchi, which was probably common to a lot of different um, places, but it, it was never violent conflict. It was never horrible, you can't deal with it kind of conflict. It was kind of subtle, and I could hear the adults talking about people being blackballed at the drain chip, uh, back to landers that wanted to join, that kind of thing. So we did hear a little bit of conflict. It wasn't huge, but it was enough to know that there is not just all you know, wine and roses here in Comchi. Something is, is amiss. So um, my research resources, um, there were 34 participants from Comchi. Some of them still live there and some of them live elsewhere. There was a 64% response rate out of the people that I did ask, which is really high, Common, more common response rate for surveys is um, around 32%. So that told me that there was a lot of interest in the community in responding and participating. 50% um, were kids in the 70s, which I thought was interesting, um, and, and pretty well representative of both the old timers and the newcomers. I, I did a questionnaire that I mailed out to everybody before I came here for a year to live with my family. I did interviews, and um, I did a, um, a an anthropological research method called participant observation where I would volunteer and, um, and just hang out with people and, and work in the community. If you use pause, that should stop that. Thank you, that's because it's very distracting. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I am a Gemini, but that was a little bit of a stretch. Um, so, then the research 
research materials I used were archives, and of course, Kelly House was a, a wonderful um, treasure trove of, of archives here. We have the Mendocino Beacon. I found all kinds of great stuff in that period of time because we had a columnist, um, uh, Elsa Thompson, who wrote <laughs> Thompson in the Coast. And um, there was, you know, I've been mentioned there a few times because of 4-H and that type of thing, but everybody in town was probably mentioned in those columns at some point. Um, there were literature and publications. I had to go to the county seat to find out how many people were in Conchie in, this, in uh, 1970. And that information, there's it's such a small town, it's not, some of those numbers are not easy to find. I couldn't believe the lengths I went to to find this one number. I just need a population in the 70s. So I had to go to the county and then I watched the lot films. So I get ready to pause it. It jumps on me. Whoops. What kind of film? Like own film? Um, I saw things like, um, I watched a lot of movies about hippies in the 60s and that type of thing. Um, a lot of news clips. There's a lot of news uh, or footage, archival footage on the internet now. It's really amazing. I saw it. Um, What I'm trying to think of the counterculture movement. Um, anyway, there's a lot of really good footage out there um, that's available on the internet. So not all of them are like complete documentaries, but there's a lot of good film clips um, that were news media. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so then, when I've collected all this data, I use this de thing called the develop the uh, developmental research sequence. So it's a and what it's a method. I'm not going to go into depth, but just in case you're interested. There's a way to analyze your findings, and you look for patterns. And that it, it, this material is just screaming with patterns. It was just, it was really fun um, to work with. And then from out of that, I cr we create what we call cultural domains that help us to organize meetings. So we're going to get into that. But um, onward. So. <coughs> So <clears throat> I went way back, and even 1500s is when the Spain uh, Spain was first sailing off the coast. But they colon the Spain colonizes California and establishes missions <coughs> in the late to 1700s. Um, Russians have a colony at Bodega Bay. By the early 1800s, there's a lot of people and a lot of nas nations that want claim to this land, and um, and all of them were, were claiming it at that time. In 1811, the Russians moved north and they established Fort uh, Ross, or Colony Ross, which probably many of you have been to. Uh, okay. Pause. In 1820 run, the Russians hunt the sea otters to near extinction, and this is kind of this pattern that starts, that we start to see here in the whole area of the North Coast with resource um, Resources like fishing and timber becoming depleted, and then that affects the population. So that totally determines who lives here and why. Um, so there's been ebb, ebb and flow of population in this whole area since it's been established, um, and it has it's directly related to resources. Who else going to the Russians out? Um, <laughs> the the U S the U S um, Navy. Yeah, the Navy them out. Yeah, and they had to leave lickety split. There's a, you know that's a wonderful story. Sad mm -hmm. story about the look out. They had to leave. I know there's plows left in the soil and, and uh, blacksmith tools laid, left out. They had to just leave. <coughs> and then there was um, the American, Me the Mexican-American War, which of course Americans won. Interesting here. Uh, I didn't really catch this in grade school. These things didn't make as much sense to me. But the um, gold rush followed immediately after that war. <coughs> um, California then was admitted into the Union because hey, we got gold, right? So they're admitted into the United States, and in 1855, the Mendocino um, Indian Reservation was established, and that went from Mendocino up towards Fort Bragg, and Fort Bragg was about um, uh, the Indian Reservation and overseeing that, not necessarily a military outpost for war, although it could have had to do with keeping the Russians out and that type of thing, but it was primarily linked to the reservation. <coughs> In 1862, Conchie's first homestead was established, and that's a fun story that we're going to get to. 
1873, Indian lands were released to the public domain. So Indians on the Mendocino Reservation came from all over Ukiah. They were in, pushed inland, and they weren't used to the coastal weather. It's really hard for a lot of them. <coughs> but I think when we're talking about immigrants, which the story is about, you know, I wanted to look at, well, who was here first? Who was here very first? And I want to acknowledge that. Um, <coughs> So Pomo means people, and most native tribes, that's true, that their name translates into the people. They were a confederated tribe, Damn. Uh, meaning that they were, there's more like a lot of small bands. They weren't all one big pan tribe that, um, that had the same practices and beliefs. They were all slightly different. Um, and in pre-contact, there was around 8,000 people here. They had their um, summer camp at Bull Down at Big River where we all love to go, and um, that becomes a significant spot in this story. The, um, so yeah, military outpost was in Fort Bragg for the Minnesota Indian Reservation. And that reservation was 25,000 acres. That was a lot of land that was a lot, but that's how all of our ancestors bought land here. Originally, whoever bought that land, that's where it came from. And the Indians then were moved um, east into, uh, was it Round Valley? Cold, or cold 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 yeah. There's one little reservation still in Fort Bragg. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Off of, oh, off of the, uh, mm -hmm. no, no, off of the river. Really? Is that right? Is there anyone still there? Yeah, it's behind North Cliff, I think. Wow. Thank you for that. So this is a wonderful story about um, Newman Hoke. <coughs> he came up here with a hunting party from San Francisco, and he was 28. And he, lo he they landed at Bull Down, down at Big River. And he got out, and he was amazed at the, the country here. And it was probably even more beautiful then. Without, there was no bridges and roads. <laughs> I mean, it was probably just amazing. He was charmed by the beauty of the Virgin Wilderness. He followed a party of Pomo Indians over a trail which led from Mendocino to Ukiah. And that was a story that his daughter, Charlotte Hope, uh, wrote in the 50s. <coughs> now, I think it's really a wonderful thing. And every time I, since I've done this research and I found this out, every time I go over the Pomp to Ukiah Road, <coughs> that was established by the Pomo people who walked from Bull Down to Compshe. Mm -hmm. And that was their prairie camp where they pounded, and Katie Tyle loves to tell the story. Um, they pounded abalone and let it dry in the sun. They collected acorns and materials for baskets. And it was a it was a, a holdover there for, uh, I don't know, months, weeks, but a while. And then they would eventually then finish their journey over to Ukiah where they would winter. So Compsi was <coughs> a very important stopover place. And it continues to be. That's probably why I include the Indian part in this because it, it was already, they sort of set the stage for the wonderful place that this is. <coughs> this was a New and Hoax ranch, and these hills are really distinctive. And I think this is now the Grimes Ranch, am I right? Yeah, that's it's the Grimes, Grimes Ranch. ranch but uh, Smith owns it, Oscar okay. Smith. And I've personally never been out there, but I know I would recognize those hills, and that was a real distinct marker for the tribe as well. And um, so, this is where they were. So Charlotte Hope says, um, my father made an agreement with the Indians never to cut down the Indian acorn orchards or destroy their salmon waters. Mm -hmm. um, that has happened, but not by him. Not by agreement. Pardon? Not by agreement. Right, no. not by agreement. And it's just part of what happens, you know, when people buy land. Anyway, they had the permanent prairie camp. The, they have a, um, a spring out there called uh, Living Waters. And apparently, I read that it had uh, some fencing around it to keep the cows out. Um, but it's apparently a real healing mineral water. I don't think it's potable. For, you know, it's not used for drinking, but I think it's for, um, there's a lot of minerals in it. And as we know, a lot, I, our family had a hard time with uh, mineral water. Um, you couldn't drink it. Um, they would, as I said, they gathered acorns and that kind of thing. There's a burial mound um, somewhere out there on that ranch for Chief Compshe, um, a high point at the Hayfield and Prairie Camp. There's um, 
discrepancy about the name of, of Compsi, what it means, and there's some uh, research I found that said it means the Valley of Many Hills or something like that. But I did find, so I didn't really mention it because we're not sure, but I did see it mentioned quite a number of times that there was a chief Compsi. So the place mm -hmm. was likely named for him. But there are, this is in, you know, research, uh, historical research, there's often discrepancies and you don't quite know exactly what's right, but um, anyway. Now the one thing I think is important too is there was 50 years of peaceful coexistence, at least 50 years, mm -hmm. um, between the, the early settlers of Compsi and the Como, and they, they came and go, they came and went, and they continued on their, their cycles. Whereas elsewhere in Anderson Valley, it, this wasn't the case. Pe Indians were getting raided and kidnapped to go work on farms and do harvesting and that type of thing, and so they weren't treated so well other places, and then you have the reservation, so that's not a good thing, but for some interesting reason, the Pomo, Comanche, <coughs> the Camp to Big River were able to keep going back and forth for quite a while. So Comanche is established in 1877 with their post office where it still is today. Um, is that the same spot where in 1877 did they move it? They, they moved it. They right moved it, okay, but it was the same. It's the same building, the same track it with some horses. So I love this picture. It's the same post office. It just amazes me. Um, and here we have Charlotte Hope right there. Minnie Hope's daughter. And there's some other Hopes. Um, there's all the names here. Oppenlander, Hope, Thompson, Docker, and just the Strauss names that you hear a lot in the there's all the kids there. Comchi kids. Comchi <laughs> kids. Comchi yeah. kids. Um, Comchi is a timber and hay. They supply a lot of timber, but a lot of hay for the oxen that were used in the timber industry. So Comchi, I don't know if, if you, some of you haven't been out there. Um, it's you get through all the trees, you drive through uh, these you know endless redwood forests, and then you start coming into this valley. And there's another little valley, and there's beautiful you know grass. Um, their hay fields. So that hay was used and then grown for a lot of the work um, teams of the animals that they had. And here's just some of those great old logging photos. Um, this is a really wonderful part of the story. Um, splitting railroad ties. Uh, Buddy Stimback, he tells that story. And uh, I have his quote there a little further down, but I love this picture because it really shows clearly, oh yeah, we all know what those railroad ties are, but when I always heard about railroad ties and um, tie landing and different references to different the railroad days, ties, yeah. well, what are railroad ties? You know, now <laughs> I really understand it, and here's some more stacked up ready to go. Um, and then this is quoted right from one of the interviews that I did. Um, this is an old time uh, Comchi resident. He said, lumber companies like the Finns, they worked hard and didn't complain. Comchi was known for making ties. Southern Pacific Railroad bought Albion Lumber Company for the supply of lumber to make ties. It was easy for an immigrant to get set up. All they needed was a cross cut saw, a handsaw, and a sledgehammer. For not much expense, they could be in business. Land was easily acquired. The Homestead Act opened up. I remember the steamship ads that said, go west, young man. <laughs> and that really happened. And there was a lot of uh, immigrants from different uh, European countries that came here that had worked in the uh, timber industry um, in Europe. And they, they were recruited here in this type of uh, way. And um, so that's, yeah, I just think that that's a really important part of, of the story. And this also. Um, uh, I don't know if David Taya's grandfather or dad or who, Andrew Taya? Father. Father. Father and his dad. Okay. And that's, I just think that's an amazing picture. So there were early communes on the coast. The hippies weren't the first ones to set up communes. <laughs> I thought, that's interesting, because all these patterns that I'm looking for, mm -hmm. right? So Sointalo <coughs> was a Finnish commune. It was in Fort Bragg, but, and this picture I believe is in Compshi. It was in the Kelly House's Compshi um, files. But I still think that it's a good representation of what it would be like to set up house in the woods. Um, and 
they were a Finnish uh, commune that started with poor families, um, and I like how they, this is something that Comchi style, this kind of building bee, everybody helping each other, barn raisins or quilting bee kind of approach to living in the country. They helped each other and they depended on each other. There were a number of communes out here and they were mostly based on language, shared languages, German, there was Portuguese, there was Finns, there were, and they, um, they're based on their ethnic heritage and mode of exchange. They had, sometimes they brought their own uh, currency. So, and this was, um, you know, Compshi was about logging, and it, it still is, but not to the degree that it was then. And this is logs coming down Big River, and that's, uh, that blows my mind. <laughs> yeah. And then this is the Big River, um, and I don't know exactly if, the, if this is at the mouth or what, but the remembering that Bull Dam was the camp, the summer camp for the Pomo, mm -hmm. which that is no longer the case here. Um, social life in the Redwoods, everybody was very isolated. Mm -hmm. They built a conscious community hall, which was completed in 1913, maybe not quite completed. Yeah. And this is just a crease in the photograph, it's not lightning bolts or anything. <laughs> but, um, and this is the Oppenlander family. Hello, that, if you're late, you have to sit in the front. Do they? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you came. Picture of the Upham Leonard family with their dog up there. That is just something that you would see today. Just um, it, it's that kind of life out there. Um, so people were living really isolated, and um, they a lot of their single men were living in mill shacks. It was just like a little RV. I mean, today we probably would have pulled those little RVs out there and lived in those. But they had these little mill shacks, and when they um, would get together, and they, these are wonderful stories that are written. Um, uh, Helen, uh, Docker, Ethel Docker wrote a wonderful book about this, and she said that some of the cabins out there had walls that were removable, so they'd um, pull out a wall and probably put it outside, and then they'd throw all the kids in the back room to go to sleep, and they would dance all night. <laughs> and because it was a, took a long time to get to people's houses, it took must have taken hours by horseback or a, or a wagon or something, maybe even a day, because sometimes people would come from Albion and Comchi. So it was a long drive. So you didn't just go to somebody's dinner and then go home. You had to stay the night. So they would make a weekend of it. And that, that really helped to sustain the community. And this kind of partying in the woods is a thing even Compshi that persists to this day. <laughs> so, and the Compshi Community Hall is still an incredible building um, that is housing of so many wonderful celebrations and, and some probably some sad ones too and there's memorials and things. But it's a really important building in Kampji. Um, I This scene you would see in the 70s and even today, the kids with the animals and they're just, you still see this kind of thing. Um, Kampji, so this is a statement from Charlotte Layton in her um, book about the Kampji fire. She wrote, Kampji section so well known for its beauty, which enjoys a greater reputation for a health-giving climate. It, it was in search of that precious treasure, health, that I came to Kamshi. The yard about my house had been sown to red clover. A few fine young redwoods standing with their feet in a green mat only added to its beauty. That could fit today. It's still, that's what I was surprised with about going back to Kamshi in 2008. Wow, it's still beautiful. Nobody ruined it. It's, how did they do that? So, um, and this was her, Charlotte Lawton's, uh, Leighton story that I pulled that quote from, and that's um, a publication of the Comchi Fire Department. That's a really interesting story. I don't have time to go into it. Comchi in the 40s, just kind of skimming through the decades here. Um, I thought it was really interesting um, to hear that um, a lot of the women, because the men were off either in war or working, and so the women uh, volunteered to take, uh, keep watch. Is that Keen Summit where they did that? And uh, did I? One thing I forgot to say is, since this is anthropology and it's research, it's like living a living project. Mm -hmm. So participants that are here, that if you see any errors or corrections or clarifications that need to be made or misspellings in names, please let me know because I want to make sure that this is correct yeah. as it can be. <laughs> yeah, Galena yeah. Matt. That's Lena Michelle's name. Thank you. That's what because short. That's why yeah. in the in the 
records of Kelly House, this is Lena Mack, but it's Lena Chesney. Yeah. Is that Lena, L-E-N-A, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. She uh, was an artist. Okay. Great. And there's a couple other names here that I, I think need correction. Um, this painting, I got it, an e-copy of it from Maya Stenbeck, so this is probably a painting in the Stenbeck family. But Pompey in the 50, this was one of the mills that was out there. This was a statement from an old timer who was a teenager during that time. Um, by the 1950s, the mills were running. There was this influx in the 50s due to the mills. I was in the first grade in 1960, and there was 33 kids in the Pompey School. The Philbrook Mill burned in 64, and a lot of people left. It was the major mill, so there was no industry here in the 60s, and a lot of people left. Mm -hmm. So. There you go, with resources, so in the, a mill is a resource too, and if you don't have the resources, the people leave, but it created this vacuum. So in the 60s, there's people moving out, and you can guess what happened next. <laughs> Here we come. So <laughs> this was a statement made by a back to the lander that I thought sounded very much like a Charlotte a lot, lot Layton statement <laughs> about um, its secluded location and expansive wilderness provide an Edenlike beauty forest filled with her healing herbs and magnificent wildflowers, and wild animals are enchanting. And then Elsa Thompson had written in her book that it's truly a garden of Eden. You hear that a lot about conch, people referring to it as this beautiful, magical place. Uh, so it's found in 18, this is just kind of recap, it's found in 1877. There is 130 square miles, and some people really like this information, so I want to provide it. Um, it's timber country, it is zoned for as a timberland preserve area. And that's important information that comes out of the second part of the story. The population in 1960, which I never did get an exact number, was, we estimated around 300, but this is the big number I went to Ukiah for, 463 in uh, 1970, because I wanted to see how much it grew, but it, by 54 people were leaving. But look at in 2010, the year I was there, it was very similar. <laughs> However, there was an aging population and there weren't as many kids. So there was a lot, um, a lot more adults in this number than here. Hippies were having a lot of babies. There was a <laughs> lot of kids. And I think this is an interesting, um, it's just kind of an edit, added statistic, but um, that there was 951 kids at the school district, you know, the whole the district, and in 2012, that was almost <coughs> half. That was Again, it was because of property in Mendocino got really expensive and pe people with families couldn't afford to live in this mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. And so there go the kids and it's an elder, more of an elder population. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so I think this is the, um, I have to go to now the second disc. My file was so large, it was kept crashing. So I thought, well, I'll make two files. Mm -hmm. So here's part two. There's nobody coming in after you, so don't okay. worry. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot to say, and I had to leave a bunch out because there just isn't time. Okay. That sign, 15 miles from Compte, I used to be a park ranger, and people would say, what, what's this place, Compte? Because you come out 128, and there's four yeah. signs that yeah. say Compte. <laughs> yeah, it's and, funny. Say, and nobody ever goes there. And I That's say, the funny thing. Don't, don't blink, you'll miss it. <laughs> That's why they say all roads lead to Washington. Because you can see them on um, coming in oh, yeah. Boonville, too. Yeah. Okay, so we have a little bit of a recap here, you know, in case you forget where we are. Um, <laughs> so this is interesting. So in the research that I did, um, I looked at uh, rural studies, and it's a topic area called rural studies. Well, what are other people finding out about, um, the, you know, immigrants moving in and, and affecting the existing community? What what happened in Comche isn't unique. Um, I, research shows there is conflict between immigrants um, and, and conflict between immigrants and established residents should be expected. So it's so common that we should just know in all of our communities there is no surprise. It it's really should be expected. Conflict among rural residents uh, is often based on fear of change. And I had this uh, participant Oh, it's right here. This quote right here, you, these change things, it's near us. That is exactly the issue. Um, 
conflict is based on assumptions and superficial appearances, and we're going to see how this one um, plays out in Hopshi. I like this general hippie stereotype. Hippie is, you know, Ronald Reagan. <laughs> so, he oh my was, goodness. He was um, <laughs> the governor. Ronald He was the governor of California in the 60s, and he dealt with the, the, Berkeley, um, the Berkeley riots and all the, the counterculture going hippies and steam protesting on the campuses <laughs> and in San Francisco at Berkeley. He was mad. He was, I've seen these, this footage of him, and he. I think it's a film called Berkeley in the 60s. There's a lot of footage of Reagan, and he gets angry. He's like, father knows best. And he's like, those bad kids. You know, he's talking about hippies as if they're just influential bad boys, you know. But they were saying something, and that's one of the points that I'm going to get to, is that there's a reason why all these young people were doing this. It wasn't just to look like Tarzan. <laughs> but um, so here's here's what this is getting into some of this reasoning. The hippie creed was, and it probably still is, <coughs> if it feels good, do it, just as long as it doesn't it, it doesn't hurt anyone. I heard that so often in comp sheet. And as I was doing my research, I found, oh, a lot of these, you know, now we have social media and we pick up phrases and things like that. But this type of stuff was in the magazines that the counterculture types were reading. So a lot of the, the slogans and the ideolo ideology were shared that way. The back to land imperative was to discover and create a new society on a human scale. So hence Compshi, people going back to land to, and this is back to the land, this isn't hippies in general, but this is, and we'll see the differences in a few minutes. But, um, and social transformation by withdrawing from mainstream and create a smaller, creating smaller communities based around relationships. People are starting to feel, to feel really isolated. They might have grown up in the suburbs after we had World War II and the big war on poverty and uh, people after World War II, every, every American was promised a home. That was totally unrealistic and they shouldn't have even said that. But it got people's expectations up and then there was the um, white flight out of the urban areas to create the suburbs. So young people growing up in this milieu and all the materialism because the people that fought World War II did without and had survived the depression and so now they want to give their kids everything and their kids were kind of just drowning in materialism. They all went to college, <laughs> really got um, educated on what's going on in the world and they started to get angry. Um, and these are their mo motivations, rejection of authority and technocracy. I heard that a lot in the back in the 70s, technocracy or in the 60s too. Um, we don't call it that anymore. It's the same thing like it's ecology and now it's environment, um, environmentalism or something. But um, that's where those things started. Frustration with hypocrisy in government, and there was a lot of that, and there still is. Um, freedom <coughs> from modern materialism. People were starting to feel pressure to, to buy stuff that's that keeping up with the Joneses thing, reacting to that. Um, there was a, a concern for ecology, uh, the natural world, peace, freedom, love, and as I said, withdrawing from middle class society. A lot of parents were scratching their heads. They didn't know. I, what are they? This is a pretty good society they're withdrawing from, is one of the statements I heard. Um, great parent um, in a film clip, and I thought, you know, that's, I'm trying to see it from their point of view now, and I would probably, if I was in their shoes, I'd probably like, we built a really good thing from you, and now you hate us. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so, there are different kinds of hippies, there are basically <laughs> three types. <laughs> There's the new left, urban, politically active, the, and those are the college campus based on students for a democratic society and weather underground, and they really wanted to work for change through politics. Back to Landers, were not into politics. The commune hippies, um, they were, sh communes were generally, hippie communes were, were generally short-lived because of, and there's there's studies and books on this and really great stuff, and I have a great bibliography if you want to read any of these books. But uh, women's roles, women were saying they wanted to drive the tractor and they wanted to go and do some of this, you know, split wood and do some of the heavier work that they weren't allowed to do before because they were women. And they were stuck in the kitchen, and they were having all these babies. And um, they were beginning to realize that, you know, if they're, they're like the Satan says, our straight sisters, at least they have security. 
because they're often having, uh, it was very common for a woman to have kids with more than one father. And so then they, and then the guys split, because it's, you know, do your own thing. So this woman <laughs> is sitting there with all these kids at this commune and in the kitchen. And, and so that was a big problem for commune. Um, and then a lack of leadership because there's not supposed to have rules. It was anti-structure. And so anti-structure just creates a vacuum and it all just fell apart. A really great quote that I read about uh, communes was somebody said it all fell, fell apart in the fridge. And I think <laughs> any of us that have had roommates might agree with that. <laughs> so back to land hippies. Um, these were hippies that are starting to have kids and they're getting to be in their late 20s, early 30s, have kids. So they are returning to the garden, starting over, and it does refer to the Garden of Eden, and that's why I think the interesting comment about Conchi is so often referred to as the Garden of Eden, and that was kind of the general idea um, for the backlanders. Withdraw from political activism, participation. I know a lot of um, backlanders didn't vote. I don't know if that's for sure, but they talked about it. Don't vote, just withdraw, don't participate. Um, rejection of materialism, consumerism, and technology. So uh, here's Joel B. <laughs> <laughs> it's like no helmets. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, counterculture hippies were influenced by the beatniks, and you know I'm sure there's some of you in here. So um, I'm hoping that I'm, I'm saying Who, it right. beatnik? <laughs> <laughs> Is there a hand over there? Yeah, the, back to what you the previous slide. There's a fourth category that I think is real important and missing. And that was the pursuit of spiritual enlightenment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. that's true, but it was, uh, I'm gonna write, make a note of that. Um, there, That should be among the, the motivations. Um, because that, my mom was really into that. Whole different right. group. You think it was a, yeah? They were a part of communes? Well, it was part of the communes, but it was a, a different purpose that was very non-political. You're right. That There was that, because my mom was motivated a lot by that, and some of her friends there, I remember hearing them talking about it, hours and hours and hours about it. <laughs> now, and then it kind of became called the New Age, but it wasn't called that then. Not then. As far as I remember. It wasn't named yet. Manage. Thank you for that, and I appreciate Manage. those kinds of comments, because you all, well, a lot of you lived through it. <laughs> so we're influenced by the beatniks. Um, Communicate ideas be, via underground press and rock and roll, which I had mentioned. Um, the lyrics, song lyrics were, had a lot of meaning in them. Today they're mostly about breaking up and falling in love, but I, I, I miss that. I miss hearing songs that have meaning. Um, a generation of young adults taking a collective stand against the establishment. That's what I think is really interesting that um, now that I'm teaching college and I see <coughs> these 20, you know, 20 something people in there and I'm thinking, in the 60s, it was this age group, and, and I do a little um, talk for them about the 60s in this one course I teach, and I tell them that it was people your age that were, you know, saying, no, this is, we can't stand the hypocrisy, we're not going to take it, we're going to drop out, we're leaving. Um, a lot of them were middle class, a lot of them were college educated, a lot of them dropped out, it, you know, there's never any absolutes and all this stuff. And many of them adopted poverty. There are not a lot of uh, hippies that um, came out of really um, poverty uh, background, but um, many of them were from you know, just from the middle class. I don't think they adopted poverty <laughs> willingly. <laughs> not necessarily They willingly. didn't know how to go back to the land. They had no training. In, in, so. in, in the sense, by adopting poverty, I mean that they, they could have made it the choice to go live off the oh, land right, and not right, make right, a yeah. lot of money yeah. um, and to live very simply mm -hmm. and to not you know go to a corporate job and stay in the city and do that whole rat race thing. Mm -hmm. So it was a, because a lot of hippies really didn't have much money. We didn't at least, mm -hmm. and but that was okay. It's not a negative. Mm -hmm. um, one old timer participant said, "Every hippie I ever knew came from some sort of affluence." So um, that's not true for everyone. But oh my goodness! So this, <laughs> is, uh, this was at their place, the Evans, uh, the Evans Farm Harmony, and um, that was a boogie. We call them boogies, and they happened almost every weekend. There was a boogie. There were a lot of musicians, and people had them dances in their field. 
I don't think this happened during the winter so much. It was pretty much a fair this weather. This was the first county fun and fair day. Oh. Or fair and fun day, whatever we called it. There were um, different types of visits. This is also, <laughs> this applies to really any population group. There's going to be people who are more funky than other people, but definitely, and so not all hippies were dirty, stinky hippies. They, they were, you know, different kinds of hippies, or factory landers anyway. And some, uh, there's quite a few that don't want to be called a hippie, and that, I, that was made very clear to me. I am not a hippie, I never was a hippie, but she is a factory lander. Um, so there's a, people get really, it, it's about identity and how you, um, how you identify. So say something about that? Yeah. Sure. Back, that's sure. back to the other chart about the list. The new left also, I, the people that I was involved with didn't consider ourselves to be. It's true. Yeah. They, you never hear that word, really. Yeah. It's just more um, caps so radicals. But those are names that a lot of uh, right-wing um, think tanks came up with to discredit the movement. There, There's a lot of literature on that, on what was done in the 80s by um, think tanks to really put the whole movement down because the movement really made change and it did rock. Well, how did the word hip come from? You know, was, was that a, music. when did it actually start? Was it was a music Does anybody scene? know? I think that Herb Cain invented the term hippie. Who did? He was like, call Herb Cain. Herb Cain. Oh, okay. Yeah. He just invented it with the term hippie. Okay. Okay, but it was Insects. from the word hip. Pardon? It was from oh, hip. From it was from hip, but hip was a term that yeah. hipsters or oh, people okay. that came from. Okay. And hip meant knowledgeable or in the know. It's kind of like in the groove, meaning, you know, exactly. in the channel, in the record. Actually, actually, the term on the hip comes from smoking opium. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yes. Wow. wow. Okay. So <laughs> And that's what's great about anthropology. You don't yeah. have to know everything. You can just present it and see what others are going to get some feedback. Yeah. yeah. So um, here's a, just a couple of slides of, of people oh, in Kamshi. Yeah. Um, this was a wedding. McCormick's? Is that McCormick's wedding? And I don't know all the adults, so I didn't put names, but <coughs> when you see kid pictures, they're all named. And that's uh, friend Johnny is not 70s. This one here? No, the left. left. This isn't the 70s. Or that's, left. that's not the 70s? Uh -huh. When it's Jennifer, 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 Jennifer. Okay, yeah. let's scratch that one because that's the oh. 80s. When it's oh. Maybe 79, but probably 80. Because I think that's what Bob and Edith's okay. um, party, their house. Right? Okay. What was it, the year anniversary? <laughs> but there was a lot of um, music and, and, you know, getting together and, oh, um, oh. what's her name? My mom, right here. Oh, Amanda. Amanda. And uh, Clayton Roberts, I didn't know him very well, but he's still in Compshi, and he came. Mm -hmm. When I called for pictures, he came with pictures, and he lives at the what was the tavern. That's a whole other interesting story, which I don't have time to talk about. I don't know which who. One? That guy who talking to Roger yeah. 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 I think that's a James, one of James Maddox's weddings. Okay. <laughs> I think you're right. A lady with long blonde hair. Oh, oh my God. Oh my God. Now, there is, I wanted to have a special slide here, and I really didn't know if you were going to be here or not. I, I, I was oh, too bad they're not going to be there because I have this one slide. But because how much he this, like there was all these it's families like that, that, yeah. that were kind of bridge families. It's with among the old timer population, there were families that really, they were just so open and got along with everyone. And the Evans were certainly one of those families from the back of the lander side. It was uh, just a little suburban housewife. <laughs> <laughs> there you were. Yeah, and you got hit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, I, I love those pictures. And Carlos. So now what yeah. I found from all the, um, from, from the material that, from the research that the interviews and the the uh, questionnaires I did with the participants, this is where we're going to get into that, and I'll try to move through it pretty quick, but sources of livelihood, differences in the other, reasons to live in Kwamshi, learning country living skills, volunteering, issues of conflict, issues in common, events, and common ground. All of this stuff came out of 
the material, and I didn't know that before. It's one of the neat things that happen when you do this, um, this data sorting afterwards. So I'll show you what we found. So sources of livelihood, old comers, uh, welfare recipient, barterer, there was a lot of bartering going on, farmer, producing eggs, dairy meat, butcher, construction worker, received family support, child support recipient, teacher, preacher, mill worker, firewood cutter, massage therapist, nonprofit agency employee, entrepreneur, investment income, vehicle repair, artist, musician, and it practically just goes off. Um, it was, but most people had, um, like this says, more than one source of income. Uh, the old timers tended to identify their work as logger, mill worker, rancher, farmer, producing eggs, dairy, and meat. A lot of sheep are, up, are raised up there, cows and cattle and sheep. Land surveyor, local business owner or employee. There's a few small businesses in Conchi. Uh, government employee, there's this, the post office and the school. Uh, fisheries, firewood cutter, social security. Um, that would be Bill Wilson probably, he was on disability. Um, and independent realtor and retirement pension. So that kind of gives you a sense too of what people were doing to fill the cupboard. So I mm -hmm. thought um, there's a conception that it's just sort of a stereotype that hippies were lazy, but I think we worked really hard. We didn't use the word chores, we didn't use the word duty, we didn't use the word, you know, the, you, words like that. Um, but I can remember my friends had, would say they had chores on the bus home. We all want to meet up after school with our horses and ride, but some of them would have chores to do, and I thought, well, I had to have chores too. So I said, yeah, I got chores too, but I really didn't. I was lying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We and I also misspelled your son name. Um, here's Bob Evans with his butcher uh, shop, and um, there's David Kaya. I'm not sure what he's doing there. Something. Um, there's Jody Evans down there cutting hair. There's probably a lot of bartering going on there. And I can cut things. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's what I was going to say. Six pack of Pepsi to your hair cut is doing. That was the only time we were allowed to have Pepsi. I haven't given it up either. <laughs> and, you know, people working on their land. Um, there's a lot of really great pictures of this sort. Um, the, the different household amenities that people had in their homes. Um, and, and again, this is from information from both old timers and newcomers. I thought it was really interesting. Just about everybody had a radio. If nothing else, they had a radio. And some people, one family had nothing. They had none of it. We're all have none of this stuff. And um, not even no plumbing or anything. But um, I know there was one back to Lander family with a microwave oven, because that's the oh. very first time I ever <laughs> saw one, but they didn't participate in the study. <laughs> <laughs> other people mentioned other things that they had here. Um, but there was a lot of propane things. There was yes. a lot of propane stuff. And there was a, uh, well, just remember this chart because I'll refer back to it mm -hmm. in a few slides that this kind of comes back in, again in, in the pattern of things. Um, so this difference is the other. I asked people, how did they refer? I mean, when you're only with your group, how do you refer to the other? And people were really honest, it appears. <laughs> um, one thing that really was, was a, the most common comment from old timers about the newcomers was that the backlanders really smelled bad. You guys smelled oh, bad. You know, it was not patchouli. It was the patchouli, yeah. not really body odor so much. And some people didn't have showers. They didn't have, as you could see, the household amenities. They may not have had indoor plumbing. Um, and they would go to Bill Wilson's to shower. Or go swimming in the river, mm -hmm. um, but there was, you know, that was. I thought that was kind of funny that the, one of the most common uh, comments about the newcomers was was smell. That was the biggest differentiation. But and then the hair um, and the food. Uh, probably like pie crust because women, hippie women were. And I'm sorry, I use the term lightly. Backlander women were making um, whole wheat pie crust. And um, <laughs> Comchi is really big on pies. We do a lot with pies out there. And <laughs> 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 this pie crust yeah. really wasn't working. <laughs> 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 
So, and this <laughs> comment about does he salute the flag, that would come up at the Grange um, when they were trying to decide whether they to admit new members because, you know, Backlanders were withdrawing from the government and, uh, or, you know, supporting the government being patriotic and said, no, they wouldn't salute the flag. They would use it as a patch on their pants, which was a no-no back then. Now it's all over the place on everybody's clothes. But I remember when I was a kid, you, you didn't use, you shouldn't use the flag for, you know, patches and stuff. But anyway, so there was differences. Um, <coughs> <laughs> These signs, they're, oh they're, um, <laughs> they're meant in jest. I, mean, I don't think they, these were yeah. real. They, I don't remember us ever, but they're they're like jokes. But they're also in all good jokes. There's a there's elements of truth. Yeah, there's something. And so this is kind of the basic representation, graphic representation of the conflict and controversy. It's sort of funny, but yet it's there. And and they did get rid of it. They did overcome it. So this it has story has a happy ending. But these are the, um, the slang that we used, and I will let you guys read that yourselves. <laughs> you can see this. Do you want to still read this? Reasons to live in Kamshi, and this was so so, um, cited by both new and old um, uh, residents, nature, the natural beauty, just like was stated so eloquently by those two women. Um, health, children, a great place to raise kids, land use, of course, timber, ranching, and farming. Um, and one lady was, Clara Jackson, was very upfront, and she just said, so I can grow and smoke pot. And she's like, I'll come out and tell everybody. And she's not afraid to talk about it, or you know, she's now in her 80s, um, and still smokes pot. But she has her license, and you know she's just very. I'm, I'm from Washington State, and it's legal there, so I've become a lot more comfortable talking about this. <laughs> but otherwise, pot is not really in this um, study because it, since it's illegal in, in California, I didn't, we won't talk about it. But <coughs> there were still people that, that that brought it up, so I included because to not talk about it would also be weird because everybody knows it's there. Mm -hmm. um, can I just say one thing? Mm -hmm. The children, a safe place to live and raise kids. When you were a child, you could run all over Kamshi with no fear. Mm -hmm. And yeah. now there is fear, but it's not because of uh, you're afraid your kid's going to get kidnapped or something, but there are now wild animals oh. that the old timers used to take care of. Oh, they, interesting. Every varmint they did in because it was it was right. a because it would eat the garden it, it would yeah. eat yes. it yeah. 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 and chickens. now small children can't run around Kamchi oh. so, wow yeah. there are mountain lions there's there's bears. Bears. Yeah. yeah there's some big things mm -hmm. about this so it was it was a very oh, yes <laughs> <laughs> that's true um, and so here's uh, some uh -huh. great kids um, Bill Wilson is He's not an old timer, an old old timer, but he was there. I think he moved there in the fifties. Is that right, Larry? Do you think? Uh, I don't think he was there in the fifties. He came he's in the sort 60s. of a probably the in mid between to, mid to late sixties. But yeah. Edith acted more like an old timer. She was active in the Grange, and, and those were her friends and, and stuff. So, but Bill interacted a lot with the newcomers, and he would load us all up in his. Well, he would go around and collect trash from people, making a dump run. He would throw their trash in there and he'd put us kids on top and he'd go to the borrow and do the dump run and then he'd, he'd get us all candy at the store and drive us back. <laughs> and a lot of his kids spent many times um, riding on the cattle rack. He taught a lot of us how to drive in that pickup. It was three on the tree. And uh, <laughs> this is uh, Scott Evans and here's me at a uh, wedding in our pasture. Scott's also at a wedding in your pasture. Scott. The one with Scott? Oh, yeah. And there's the McDonald's that's um, one of the pictures they stay with yeah. my old pictures. <laughs> there's more trees in the front now. So here's um, some other Kamshi kids. Oh, good. And I, said, Matt's, I caught Matt's <laughs> misspelling and I didn't catch it in time on it. <laughs> Thank you. There's another place where I think it's from. Sorry. Katie Yeah. Katie's right one. This is um, so 
that would be the, these two women, or at my house, between a couple of my sister, these two are sisters. These kids, this is one of the Parker boys, they lived out in the commune. There was a commune out there for a while in Comchi. Um, anyway, just kids and animals, it was great. There was a, how did we learn to live in the country? Most of the, um, I, w I don't know, I guess I could say most. A lot of the back to landers did not know how to live in the country in every way that you need to. They might have known how to do canning or something. I've heard some people came with experience on how to cook with a wood cook stove. But um, this is, I just thought it was really interesting where, where the back to landers got their information and how did mm -hmm. they learn. Uh, because I, and then these, these um, books and, and periodicals that we had, I don't know if you can read them all, but no. they're like the Foxfire series and uh, Mother Earth News and Country Woman Magazine and Albion Magazine, Farmer's Almanac. Uh, and then, so resources that are books and journals, and then there's a lot of people resources, person-based resources, old timers. Um, Boy, we asked a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and there were old timers that were patient and would sit and teach you how to do stuff, especially the women with sewing and embroidery and that type of stuff. A lot of women. What's the name of the sewing group? Uh, sew and sews? Sew and sews and stitch and bitch. Which group? Which group? <laughs> um, but anyway, just lots of different, um, you know, a lot of old timers would say, you know, they just grew up that way and they, it was things that you almost take for granted. Yeah? When I moved to Comchi, I moved into the old East place that's on our spring. And it was like a road map. It had a root cellar, it had an orchard, it had chickens, it had, you know, all that was set up by this homesteading family. Wow. And mm -hmm. all there, it was all there. You had yeah. some interesting stories about, what, did you go fishing with Bill Beak and <coughs> learn how to can salmon or something? That you'd never do it again? Was that your story? <laughs> I'm sorry. Was that your story? Which one? About canning salmon? Anyway, yeah, it's okay. Could be. <laughs> um, Joel Zeke and I used yeah, to do Yeah, that, that was your story. <laughs> um, here's Bill and Edith Wilson that I referred to a number of times. That, um, very, very helpful for a lot of uh, back to land of families that moved in. And uh, they had took on a, a pair of kids, a brother and sister, who were basically abandoned by their mom. Uh, something happened and he let them, he built a place for them to stay and took care of them. So really great people. I mean, it, you know, not everyone gets along with everyone anywhere, but um, yeah. generally it's <coughs> that, was a, that was a good relationship. These are uh, pictures of the Comchi Grange getting some renovation work done, and there's a lot of, I don't have a lot of pictures from old timers, but there's, um, you know, just a cool good crowd of <laughs> <laughs> the crowd <laughs> there. Yeah. Uh, Richie Wells, I think he might be right there. But a lot of the men, that were the pillars of the community are in these this series of pictures of working on the Grange. So volunteering was really big. That's one of the cultural domains. Um, and the top three that uh, people mentioned were the Comptry Volunteer Fire Department, <coughs> and the auxiliary group that raises the money for the fire department, and Human Teachers Aid, and all these other um, areas of, of volunteering. Volunteering is a really big part of Comptry life, and it's part of how um, people eventually worked out their differences. So there's in <laughs> issues of conflict. Um, there's, there was social exclusion. It wasn't huge, but, but a lot of the back planners that wanted to join the Grange were not allowed because of you know the differences that we've been talking about. Um, the funny thing is one of the old timers told me a story that they, the hippies that really wanted to join just went down to Whitesboro Grange and Al Albion and joined there. <laughs> knew they could be members. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I don't know, I wouldn't have tried so hard to be a member if I wasn't wanted. But anyway, somebody was um, strong-headed about that. But issues of conflict, as we're saying, um, and then uh, appearances and smell, land oh use. Goodness. There was a lot of, um, <laughs> that's your picture. And he, so Yvonne DeWitt lived in this barn. Um, this was really a common thing to take an old barn or an old structure and turn it into a house. Um, and she just wanted the classic uh, Jack and Lander ladies. Yes. <laughs> she had a garden stuff here. This was sort of in between ownership, I, I think, isn't it? And, but she had a nice garden and, and that type of thing out there. Um, Issues of land use, I'm going to get into a little bit more on the other side, but um, 
children were also um, a, a source of conflict, not in a huge way, but in terms of all of us kids just wanted to hang out. Um, and a lot of the old timer um, girls, and in my case, because I'm a girl, and they, we all just wanted to play together and ride. And, and it, um, one of the old timer girls told me that they were really happy when we all started moving next to them. Like, more kids, great. So kids are great, they don't care. They just want to hang out and play and make friends and go do stuff. Um, but it was really, the issue really was among the adults. Um, and then, of course, partly the issue of conflict. So one of the issues of conflict w around land use in specific was that um, some back to the landers, and I don't know anyone in particular who did this, there were some, uh, quite a number of transient type of back to landers that came in and then left. But they, I think they tended to not be with families and that type of thing. But a lot of the mill shacks that the old loggers had left that you had just learned all about um, had left their mill shacks around on their property. And um, yeah, that's right. right. This is right off. Oh, right. Okay. It's an easy shot. It's yeah. right yeah. right. by the firehouse. <laughs> but they, um, some some people would come in and just take the t the timber and reconstruct a building for themselves somewhere else, um, or they would just live in them, so it was basically squatting and trespassing, and that wasn't okay. Um, so that created some conflict. Um, some people asked if they could forage on people's private land, and other people didn't. Um, so it was that do your own thing, it feels good ethic, that, w that crossed boundaries, then that's where some of the conflict came from, um, some resentment. The thing about building without permits Interestingly enough, was not an issue of conflict because everybody did it. Every, nobody, that was in, even in the county, there was, it's probably changed by now, but in the county was, yeah. Comchi's notorious for not, nobody out there builds with permits, so. Um, <laughs> it's, it is different now, yeah. Um, but, and, and now you can do aerial, you know, Google, and you, it'd be so easy to tell nowadays. Um, if you were in Kent County and wanted to find that stuff out. Um, this is a wonderful house, <laughs> but uh, this is pr a beautiful representation, I think, of the kind of structures that were being cobbled together. <laughs> you know how hard it was to get that firewood down that hill? Yeah, and it probably is hard to heat that place. I don't remember it being warm. <laughs> <laughs> there, um, there were concerns that people had in common, though, um, in in terms of everyone wanting to work on these issues together: land use, children, and water, and fire. Co fire was a common foe that that equalized everybody. Um, residents didn't call a town meeting over being blackballed by the Grange. There was a lot of gossip that went with that, but. When the issues of land use got everyone to the table, because the, the county asked everybody, uh, asked all the, the towns in the in Mendocino County. <coughs> to the There's a picture of Buddy Skinback. This is in that same Grange series. Um, they had torn out the floor here, and replacing the replaced the floor in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's events. That happened in the 70s uh, that were specific to each group. The old timers, um, in particular, had shiveries, which I'd never heard of before. And I researched them and found out that's a practice that came from Europe. And it was, um, shivery means, I think in French, means like obnoxious noise or something. Where if there was a couple shacking up and they weren't married, the townsfolk would get together in the middle of the night and make a bunch of noise outside their window, <laughs> try to shoot off guns or just bang things. <laughs> so the, the, this <laughs> ritual got brought to the south <laughs> east when a lot of the uh, immigrants came to work in the forest in the southeast. And then a lot of those people immigrated here for work. And so they brought those types of, um, of ceremonies or, or rituals with them. But it wasn't, it was then in Compton used for when people were newlyweds, mm -hmm. then they would get a surprise somewhere <laughs> in the early part of their... Jimmy had the best one. And they would shoot off uh, um, dynamite. dynamite, shoot guns, <laughs> bang top of And then the women had been up all day making food and then they'd have a big party. So <laughs> wake up, we're gonna party. Yeah. So there's, um, 
anyway, so these are the different types of events. And I'm <laughs> actually kind of moving along here. Um, Conchi had in the 70s some musicians out there that did benefits for the fire department. Um, some of them were residents, some of them came in to visit. But that uh, the Conchi fire department dinners have become famous. It blows well my mind how many people come out there still <laughs> to this day. Yeah. They become more and more popular, more mm -hmm. well organized. Oh my. So common ground, here's that you same post office. <laughs> yeah. And um, I like that this is a bunch of, of the women. I don't know who everyone is. I recognize Katie Ty and Jody Evans there on the end. Yeah. Oh so now we're starting to find common ground. The post office is common ground, the store. So they would have physical places in Kamshi, the fire department. The Grange eventually became common ground because it eventually folded. And now it's the Kamshi community organization. It's right. common ground. So there's physical places that are common ground. Mm -hmm. These county asked people to ask the, um, the towns to, to zone and create um, town plans. And so Compshi was, I found out from talking to a guy at the county who was there, he was just got ready to retire, but he was there when this was happening. He said Compshi was the only group that elected their members on this board. Other towns in Minnesota County, they were all appointed. But Compshi elected all their board members and it was good representation from both groups that were living there. Um, and so they came up with this at the end. Uh, it's a plan, and I think this should be in the library or something. It's really a Who's wonderful document. Who did the drawing? Um, e. McKenzie. Oh, yes, yeah. of course. So, mm. 97. So there's a little bit, uh, from, so this is the area we're talking about, the Compshi section being here. So these were some of the statements from that document, and this was in the back for their assessment. We found out that we were ladies and gentlemen. We don't, we had honor. We weren't sneaky or mean. We still don't agree on everything, but we are trying to, we are trying to get each other. And that was, that was um, this point of contention I heard of being mentioned a lot, this feeling that we're out to get each other and then we found out that wasn't, that wasn't true at all. We agreed on every fundamental principle. No one wanted much growth. We all wanted the big farms and timberlands to stay that way. We don't want a tourist trade here. We believe in property rights. We respect our neighbors' rights to live their own way and expect others to respect our ways. So people in Compshi want to come there and do their own thing and, and you know, within reason, as long as you're not hurting anyone. But the old timers had that value too. So they began to find that they had the same values, even though we had appearances and um, the superficial stuff, which you saw in an earlier slide, about immigrants, it's the superficial things and the fear and you know, like the smell that really got in the way. <laughs> that, but once people could get beyond that, they began to see that they really had the same, the same values. The um, common ground, this is the, the best, um, I think that comp sheet happens at this fire department. It's just amazing to this day, the people that volunteer and keep that fire going and they, um, they do continual training. You can come to Compshi and be part of the fire department. You can be the fire department. You can support the fire department by volunteering or just going to a breakfast or a dinner. You can um, volunteer and meet your neighbors. Um, it's you, And also the training that people get, uh, the f actual firefighters, I think really enhance their standing in the community as well as their own self-esteem. They're doing something that's really important and they've you know, put out many fires and I know we've probably heard about them in the, in the news when they happen. This sign is, is a really good outcome of this work that was done in the 70s. This sign hangs up in the, this, I just copied the words down, but it, it, it hangs up in the fire hall. New members urgently needed, Comptry Volunteer, Volunteer Fire Department, young, old, male or female, all are welcome. That represents huge change <coughs> in Comptry. And then they do amazing things like get on the, um, get into the uh, New York Times. Um, <laughs> so they're an amazing group. Yeah. I know, isn't that? <laughs> so this is the fire chief here. <laughs> no, <laughs> why? <laughs> so there's this wonderful thing called collective effervescence, and you know, I'm getting ready to wrap up here, but collective effervescence is part of 
in anthropology is called communitas theory. And communitas is when, like right now, we're all together <coughs> doing something and, and you know, having a good time, hopefully here by choice. And a party is like that. Communitas is important <coughs> for communities. Comp, she's really good at communitas, from the dance cabin to the early hall being built to people taking care of their needs that way, their social needs. We are social beings. And <coughs> coming together for a party and a dance is healthy. It's important. Uh, I think sometimes we get a little bit like, oh, we're not supposed to go party all the time. But you know, it's really important to party. <laughs> um, it just depends on what you do there. So Emile Durkheim is this really great French theorist in anthropology and sociology. So that's where I'm getting this from. Um, but collective effervescence is, so there's communitas, like a party is happening. And then collective effervescence is that one moment at the event when you look around and you're every, it's like that peak time. Everybody's just right there and having a great time. It might be everybody's happening to be dancing or there's a time and a meal and then everybody's just, and then it goes. But that's collective effervescence and it's something that's, that people crave and that we want and it keeps us coming back to volunteer because you know that there's going to be um, a good time at that event. We used to have uh, Easter parties. Everybody in town would bring a dish and we would party. Lisa was the Easter bunny always. <laughs> <laughs> Complete uniform. And, and it was, yeah, you go back for that good feeling that you get. It really, it does. It feeds your soul. Yeah, and it gold egg, you got a hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. You get a special egg. <laughs> But there were a lot of those types of gatherings. Um, so it's when you get out, you gather outside of ordinary reality. That's that's kind of like um, going on vacation. You, you, you leave your normal everyday uh, routine. You get together with friends or your community. And so that's basically what's happening. And it's essential. So uh, resilient communities, I would definitely say Comp, she's a resilient community. And there's this wonderful theorist called Robert Theobald. And he defines three criteria for healthy communities. One is the shared values are identified by the community. Well, that happened when they were doing the zoning. That was a three-year process. They identified their shared values. Uh, participatory decision-making, that also <coughs> happened during that time. It also happens in the other community groups in Compshi. There's the auxiliary, the fire auxiliary. There's the Compshi community organization. So there's participatory decision-making going on in all those um, activities. Shared commitment to environmental preservation, and that's definitely um, happening in Kompshi. Even though there's people doing timber work, they don't want to just cut it all down. There's, they, you know, it's managed, and um, and that's the way the, the land is zoned. And so, all of these things are part of what makes Kompshi a resilient community. Findings in rural studies. Um, there is conflict between newcomers and established residents can be expected. Relationships lead to common ground. So we found when these people could start having a relationship instead of just kind of like looking at them going by or not wanting them to come in or not wanting to socialize with those people. But when you can start having relationships, <coughs> then you can start to get to know each other. Common ground relationships reveal they have more values in common than previously assumed. And relationships are key to finding common ground. So you, it, if you're going to find common ground, you've got to build those relationships. And I, um, I didn't know this woman's name, if I don't know if anyone knows her, but um, the, the quilt tradition in Comshi is really a big part of the Yes, she Yes, yeah, I did get that one. Um, so there's a few uh, research findings that, to wrap all this up, there events and traditions create and support common ground. So we have social cohesion, fundraising, integrating newcomers. So all these things like the fire department and volunteering are a really great way for newcomers to integrate. And now whenever I go back to Conchi and I go to their auxiliary meetings for the fire, I go to just, you know, because I used to be part of that. And there's a, a new people. And it's, you need new people to keep um, communities healthy. Um, finding common ground resolves community conflict through relationships and mutual support for shared values, such as the fire department, and by providing a forum for a discussion and debate. Common ground is both a place and a quality, and it's mutually agreed upon. So when you're going to go and just squat in mill shacks, that's not cool common ground, and that's, you know, that's not 
that's going that's creating conflict. So you, you need to ask and go and have a relationship. Hey, can I stay in this cabin and I'll you know do some work around here or something? And also by being an op by being open to all and serving all organizations and communities thrive. But when they're closed, <coughs> they fold. Like the Grange, the building is still there, but the organization within it folded. Newcomers, yeah, it's more it changed. Changed. Yeah, yeah more well, a lot of the original the members they yeah. died, or yeah. and then uh, the people weren't interested. So newcomers are needed to keep communities from dying and becoming stagnant. A resilient community has ways to welcome and integrate newcomers. Comshi fits all of those things. And this is a uh, outside of the Grange right now. Um, they did mm -hmm. some, some more recent remodeling. And it's a big painting, and this is just some of the tiles on it. And it, I think it's great because it represents some of the, I think that's Jerry Philbrick, and there's just some of the newcomer, or the Axelander types here, and it represents. I don't think that's Jerry. It's not? No, no. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. It's Kim. Yeah. 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 Yeah.